on my uh, on my wall at home in my office, I've got a, a, a couple of degrees, and and they're pretty much the same. Um, but there's one subtle little difference in them. <laughs> And I'd like you to listen and see if you can pick out the difference. I mean, obviously, the degrees and the dates are different, but, but there's a subtle difference that I think you should catch. My university degree says this is to certify that Graham Wesley Gladstone has completed his Bachelor of Arts degree with all the attendant rights and privileges granted this day, June 7th. Um, you're going to think I'm so young, 2002. <laughs> I have yet to get a list of those rights and privileges. Uh, I can't walk into Laurier and say, or I can't walk into the book barn and say, I've got a degree from Laurier. <laughs> I don't get a discount. My university, my seminary degree says this, the board of directors has conferred upon Graham Wesley Gladstone, the master of divinity with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities appertaining thereto. Did you catch the difference? My university degree says that I am entitled to rights and privileges. My seminary degree says that I am entitled to rights and privileges, but I also have responsibilities. As a member of the graduating class of Heritage Seminary, I have responsibilities to accomplish. And it's not just seminary classes that are like that. Families are like that too, right? When you're a part of a family, there are certain rights and privileges that you experience. When you grow up on a farm, you get farm fresh food. It's delicious. When you have, a, when your family owns a business, you um, gain from whatever that business is. There are certainly rights and privileges involved in being part of a family, but there are responsibilities, right? Uh, I, you know, I, I was struck last week talking with my aunts and uncles about their memories of growing up with my grandma, saying, "Boy, you just knew you get off, no, you get off the bus, huh? you walk home from school, <laughs> and then you start taking the laundry in, you start peeling the potatoes. You just know there are things that you have to do as a member of a family. There are privileges and there are responsibilities." That's true of families generally, but it's also true of God's family. Being a child of God means that there are things that we need to, to do. If you think back, actually, to the beginning of this series, Ephesians 2.10 says what? God created us in advance to do good works. <laughs> we were made to do these responsibilities we are not just God's workmanship. We are not just sinners saved by grace. We are not just his children. We are not just members of his family. We are his servants. We are servants of God, created to do good work in the world. And it's not just me that's a servant of God. It's all of us who are children of God, who are, in fact, servants of God. To show you why I say that, I'd like you to join me in John 13 today. Um, I think there's some Bibles there if you don't have your own. Uh, you can see in John 13 a very famous story. Uh, this is the foot washing account uh, in John's Gospel. So John chapter 13, <clears throat> we're going to start right off the bat at, at verse 1. John 13, 1 says this, it was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his control, and that he had come from God, and was now returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Now think about that for a moment. From a worldly point of view, that sentence doesn't make any sense. <laughs> the words before the so in that sentence do not line up with the words after it, right? If a sentence starts, usually, if a sentence starts, he knew he had all the power in the world, 
then the part after the so should go, so he made his inferiors do the dirty work, right? The Toronto Maple Leafs coach is in charge of the whole team, so he has water boys fill up the Gatorade bottles, right? The, the president of the United States is the leader of the free world, so he has somebody else fold his underwear and clean his toilets. Generally speaking, the powerful are served by the powerless. And yet here, Jesus turns that on his head. He had all the power in the world. All things came from him and through him, and he was in charge of them, and he had come from God, and he was going back to God. Nobody else could say that. It was the greatest person that was on earth. <sighs> by the ways of the world, his right would have been to get the apostles to get down on their knees and wash his feet. But instead, the Son of God knew that all power belonged to him, so he used that power to serve his people. He used the power and privilege that he had as the Son of God to serve his people. The Son of Man didn't come to be, uh, to be served, but to serve, right? Mark tells us. Verse 5 tells us how he does it. He, he poured water into the basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Jesus, Jesus got down on his hands and knees and braved the stink and grime of the disciples' feet and wiped them off with his own hands and then dried them on the towel that he was wearing. The Son of God served his disciples. And it didn't make any sense to them, right? They were still thinking along the world's lines. Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? That, that's crazy, right? Peter is thinking, you are, are my superior, as if you're going to serve me. I, I, I know the, uh, did you see this this week? Um, Queen Elizabeth celebrated her 70th uh, year in, in, um, uh, in charge. <laughs> her 70th reign, 70th year of reign. Um, and, and it was neat, her, her royal letter, I put it on Facebook and you might've seen it somewhere else. She wrote this royal letter to her uh, subjects and, and she signed it, your servant, Queen Elizabeth. And, and that's lovely, but come on, Queen Elizabeth is not gonna show up at your door with a vacuum cleaner in her hand, is she? <laughs> Generally speaking, the powerful are the ones who get served. They are not the ones who serve. And yet Jesus says, that's not how we do it in our family. Everybody serves each other. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, you got to learn to be the servant of all. And there's some back and forth about that with Jesus and the disciples. Then verse 12, when he had finished walking, washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He said, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus is calling his people to be servants of God. He's setting for us an example to follow. When he says no servant is greater than his master, the implication is that we are the servants and God is the master and we are to be his servants. Um, yeah, yeah. If you are a follower of Jesus, then you are called to be a servant of God. That is, is something I think that we need to wrap our minds around. When I first came to faith, I was more than happy to talk about all the rights and privileges of being a a child of God. You know, I would go to church and, and revel in worship and, and enjoy time uh, in the presence of, of God. And a lot of people do that, and that's good. But there's more to faith than rights and privileges, isn't there? 
there are responsibilities to. If we are children of God, then it makes sense that we would follow in our big brother's footsteps and serve the world as, as he did. If you are a child of God, then you are a servant of God. I realized that, that that might be a bit of an abstract idea. So I sat and I thought to myself, okay, sermon series is who am I? What does it mean to my identity for me to consider myself a servant of God? And I think I put it like this. If I'm a servant of God, then my priority should be to do God's will. If I am a servant of God, then my intention is going to be to put the master's purposes first, to put my own purposes in the back seat if they don't line up with the Lord's. If I am the servant of the Lord, then I am going to do what the master wants me to do. And what does the master want us to do? Slide your finger down just a little bit to verse 34. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. We are servants of God, and the master calls us to love one another. The way that he loved us, selflessly, wholeheartedly, we are servants of God called to do the master's work, which is to love people in the world. That's the take home here. We are servants of God called to do the master's will to serve the world in love. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus reaching out into the world to care for people. Right? Jesus can't literally wash feet now, and yet that is in part our job. When I was in, uh, when I was in university, I played a couple of times on worship teams with this guy, uh, Shadrach Cabango who has gone on to be a Juno award-winning uh, hip-hop artist. <clears throat> and um, he has this song lamenting, Shad is his uh, performance name. He has this song where he's lamenting the fact that people around the world don't have enough to eat. Um, and I, clearly I can't rap like him, but he says this, Lord, please, can we speak on this frankly? Like, God, why are you letting this happen? Amen. He answered, son, I'm asking you the same thing. Because you're supposed to be my servants out there working like you're my hands and feet reaching out to those that's hurting. We sometimes like to think that God is going to miraculously drop in and make everything right. And yet, in part, that's our job. <laughs> we are the hands and feet that make these good things happen in the world. These are the acts of service that God created us for in the first place, as Ephesians 2.10 says. We have a job to do. We are part of the family business, which is to bless the world as God intends for us to do. So let's, let's think about this in, in practical terms. Okay, I'm going to ask you some questions, and you can nod yes or no. Are you a child of God? Yes. Then that means that you are a member of God's family, right? Yeah. There are privileges that come along with that. Eternal life, the right to be called children of God, the Holy Spirit living and working in you, those are real rights and privileges that we have. There are also responsibilities. We are called to do the master's work, which is to extend his love into the world. Now, as a church, I think that we do this really well. You know, um, the sense I get here is that if something needs to get done, no matter how menial, you'll have five people jump at it to just get it finished. Right? We got a why not meal. Great. All the food's there within, within a couple of days. Uh, communion's coming up. Everybody will pitch in and help out. Um, sand the entire sanctuary and repaint it so that it sparkles. Yeah, why not? This church is full of servant-hearted people. Uh, at a previous church that I was a part of, the pastor there did, uh, I think, eight-part sermon series called Hearts of Servants uh, or Servant Heartedness, something like that, um, because the people there had no real interest in, in serving one another. Like, they complained about being asked to put on coffee for fellowship time. That's not this church. You are well behind that, uh, beyond that. This is a servant-hearted church. 
Um, that being said, I don't follow you home. And so I don't know what you're like at home. I assume you're the very same as you are here, but I'll say this just in case. Being a servant of God does not end when you leave the church. Being a servant of God is a 24-7, 365 days a year thing, right? I'm not just a parent. I'm a servant of God who is raising children in light of that. I'm not just a teacher or an educator. I'm a servant of God who is instilling these things into children. I'm not just a, uh, an administrator. I am a child of God and a servant of God who is organizing people as God's servant. So think, how can you engage your family or your workplace as a servant of God, extending God's love to other people? That, that's the question. You know, Jesus didn't cling to his divinity. He didn't cling to his um, superiority as God, but instead he gave it up, right? Philippians 2, he took the nature of a servant, not just a servant, but a man who would go to the cross and die for us. How can you apply that same selfless, self-giving love in your own situation? Now, Jesus calls us to love one another as he did, selflessly, redemptively. How can you apply that in your life? You know, I can bring you some, some principles and say, um, you know, see yourself as a servant of God. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Look known not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. But in the end, this is something that you need to work out in your own life. So what does it mean to be a servant of God in the situation that you are in now? We are servants of God called to do the master's will. <sighs> we are servants of God tasked with doing the master's good will, which is to extend his love to the world. Uh, getting ready for today, I came across a poem um, that's often attributed to Teresa of Avila, and I'll close with this. It goes like this. Um, Christ has no body now, but yours. No hands, no feet on earth, but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion upon the world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses the world. You are his hands, you are his feet, you are his eyes of compassion, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. We are servants of God, responsible to do the master's goodwill. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for coming to serve us. Not only did you wash your disciples' feet, but you laid down your life to redeem each and every one of us. Thank you for that grace, and thank you for that example that you have set, to love one another selflessly and completely. I pray, Lord, that you would help each of us to figure that out in our own lives. We very naturally understand ourselves you know, just as we are, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to see ourselves as your servants first. And then the other responsibilities that we have, we do those in light of our commitment to you. I pray that you will help each of us in the next, uh, in the next week to think about this um, in, in the moment that we would stop and say, oh, yeah, what, what does this mean for me to be a servant of God in this moment? Lord, lead us and direct us. May we work with the energy that you yourself so powerfully provide in us. And Lord, thank you that we do this as, as servants. Uh, not, not just as servants, but as, as children. Uh, John, uh, Jesus and John later says, you know, I don't just call you servants, I call you friends. We are not disposable servants. We are treasured children who have responsibilities. Lord, help us as we live that out. We pray in Jesus' name.